Well, we are talking about the better life, right? The better life. And uh, most of the uh, most of the series will take place in Psalm 1. We're going to be covering the six verses of Psalm 1 over about seven or eight week period of time. Uh, but this is really kind of introductory. This is just kind of setting the stage for what we're going to hear. Uh, last week, last week we, we looked at uh, the better life, and I mentioned kind of the problem. I mentioned that in order to get from point A to point B, you have to know where point A is, right? You have to know where we are at spiritually before we can get to the next to the next uh, letter, so to speak. The, the, where, where are we going? How do we get there is really determined on, on where we are today. And I mentioned a, a handful of things, of problems that we have, and the problems that we have uh, really are us, by the way. Uh, First of all, I mentioned the love of self. This is predominantly uh, our, one of the issues in America is we love ourselves so much, don't we? We think so highly of ourselves that we tend to pamper ourselves. So I mentioned that there's a love of self. I mentioned there's a love of pleasure. And I gave you verses with all of these things uh, where there's a love of pleasure. Because we love ourselves so much, we want to please ourselves. We want to give, give, give us everything that our heart desires because we love ourselves so much. I mentioned that there's a love of preeminence. That's the kind of the me first mentality. It's uh, putting me first, and, and I think a lot of people want to be the first in line. They want to be the first to receive. Uh, they they want to they want to they want to have the first prize, and the preeminence is oftentimes a problem. So their love of preeminence. There's a love of money. There's a love of the world. We talked about the love of praise. And then lastly, I concluded with that in this society we live in today, that there is a love of darkness. Now, this has always been the case. There is a love of darkness. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. That's what it says in the Bible. So uh, we don't want what God has for us because when he starts to reveal his truth, it will expose our error. So we, 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 love, we love ourselves, and that's a huge, huge problem. And that's the point A, by the way. That's where we are at today. We love ourselves so much and, um, that, that uh, oftentimes it hinders us from getting to point B, to where God is, because we want everything for ourselves. So we must be careful with that. Today, today I'm going to kind of lay a little more groundwork in discussing the better life. And we're going to talk about some things, primarily uh, the issue of quality of life. The quality of life. Now, that is a kind of a buzzword. We hear that. Uh, I know that there are agencies, uh, generally governmental agencies, that, uh, that, that uh, are compiled with really smart people, uh, very well-educated people, that go around and they compile all of this data and try to determine what quality of life is for people. Okay? Uh, they use, a, they use a handful of things. They use things like safety. They use things like health, wealth, uh, education, geography. They use all of this data, and they try to figure out uh, some, some models. And how is it, where are we at in our quality of life, and how do we have an improvement of quality of life? Because I think that this is a big idea. This is a big idea. People are wanting to improve their quality of life. They honestly, secularly speaking, they want a better life. So what they do, what society does, the secular world, they take all of these things, these, the, the health and the, the safety and the wealth and the education and geography, and they, they create models. And how do we get a better life? Now what they do, their model is much different than our model. The way that they look at improving their quality of life, how to have a better life, is different than the way that we, as Christians, should be looking at how to improve our lives. One of the factors that these agencies use to determine quality of life is known as the GDP, which is called the Gross Domestic Product. and It's described as a monetary measure of the market value of the final goods and services services produced during a period of time. Oftentimes, it's, it's, uh, it's populated quarterly or annually. They, they create this GDP. So what they're saying is, is we're going to determine a quality of life based on the quality and quantity of goods and services we provide to people. That is what the secular world has done. They have said, we need to figure out how good a person's life is by what they have, essentially speaking. 
And they use, in, they use these things, this safety, health, wealth, education, and geography, to determine uh, some of these values based on the gross domestic product. Okay, that's what they do. Now, interestingly, Robert F. Kennedy says that the GDP measures everything except that which makes life worthwhile. Because let me tell you something, that the safety, health, wealth, education, and geography, all of those things combined shouldn't equate to a better life. I'm going to get to that in a few moments. Let's look at a couple things. Really two points this morning. First of all, point number one, quality, quality doesn't mean Abundance. The quality of life you live does not mean that you have an abundance of things. Um, with, with, with many people, they think that the more things they have and the better things that they have, they, they think that they have a better life. That's how they equate it. Even, even Christians will say that I have better stuff, more stuff, and so I have a higher quality of living or a higher quality of life. We have a better life. Uh, this, however, is not the case. Uh, quantity and quality things do not necessarily mean a quality life. Okay? A better life, it will literally, a better life, pay attention to this, will literally transcend beyond the quality and quantity of things. It does not matter how much stuff you have and how good that stuff is. It does not determine a, a higher quality of life. Now, Jesus, he spoke of a parable uh, to his disciples in a, in a very similar uh, way. He speaks of this on his journey from, uh, from the region of Galilee down to Jerusalem. And those of you who will be with us in Israel, many of you in this room will be in Israel in February. So that's exciting. And uh, we'll understand this geography. But as he, as he traveled from kind of the region where he did most of his ministry, honestly, to the cross, he was presented with... Uh, a, a question, and here's the question. It begins in Luke 12, verses 13 to 21. And one of the companies said unto him, and one of this company were not just the disciples. Uh, it could have been one of the disciples, but I, I think it's referring to the vast majority of people that were following him because of the miracles which he performed. Okay, so one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Now, this is a real uh, unfamiliar situation because uh, we've never had problems with inheritances in our families, right? Uh, we know that this is no new problem. This took place 2,000 years ago, and there was a question uh, to the Lord about this inheritance. There's inheritance within my family, and it must be divided. Lord, will you speak to my brother that he divide it equitably, is what he's saying. There was a problem within this family, and it was up to Jesus to have the answer. Verse 14, he says, And he said unto them, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Who am I to be able to tell you how to divide your inheritance appropriately? He goes on in verse 15, And he said unto them, Take heed. Now this is really neat. And I, we've gone over this verse before, but this is really neat because this was what he was trying to convey to this person who, who presented him with this question. Take heed and beware of covetousness. Beware of this thing called covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable. So now Jesus is speaking a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, this will I do. This is the man's conclusion. He had an abundance, and this is his conclusion. What should I do with all this? He says, I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things which thou hast provided. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now this parable tells the eternal fate of someone who put forth his treasure as being his, his earthly possessions. This is what he treasured. 
his earthly possessions. And he says at the end of verse 20, who shall those things be which thou hast provided? When you die tonight, if you were to die tonight, whose, whose will all that stuff be? All the stuff that you've accumulated, talking to this rich farmer. Who's it going to be? And he finalizes it with it in verse 21. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Here we see something really interesting. As we're talking about the better life and, and the quality of life doesn't mean abundance. Pay attention. Quality of life doesn't mean abundance. Here's what, it, here's what he's saying here in this parable. The things that the farmer had did not make his life any better. In fact, in fact, they actually made his life more complex, didn't they? He had to figure out what is he going to do with all the stuff in which he's accumulated. The better life for this farmer was not one of abundance. That was complexity. Abundance has nothing to do with the quality of life. One commentator, he said this, that his attitude was that he would have an easy life because he had everything he could possess or possibly want or need. But then when he died, what would happen to all of his stuff? If you want a better life, it's not about all of the things that you have. It's not about your possessions. All the stuff in the world doesn't make your life any easier. And when you begin to analyze these people who had a lot of stuff, like, for instance, this parable here, what is our life going to be like when we die? I know my, my mom is taking care of uh, her mother-in-law right now. And as she's taking care of her mother-in-law, she says, we're really, trying to, we're really trying to help her, and at the same time, we're trying to help you. And I didn't really understood what that meant. And what, what she was saying, what she was saying was, we are trying to downsize and get rid of this stuff so you don't have to deal with it when we die. I don't know how many phone calls you've gotten where you've had to deal with stuff that other people had owned. My mom, she's been trying to get rid of this table for years to her, to her children. She calls me every now and again. She says, honey, do you want? No, I don't want that. And she says, well, it's funny. Nobody wants it. And I'm like, mom, you didn't even want that. You got it from your mother. That's why you keep handing it down. And now you're trying to figure out what I'm going to do with it. I said, mom, if it comes to me, it's going to Goodwill. And she's like, you wouldn't do that. And I said, well, you won't know, will you? Abundance doesn't necessarily mean quality of life. Ecclesiastes says this, Solomon had this right, by the way, better is a handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. Here's what this is saying. Some people struggle to, uh, to, to uh, procure it. Others struggle to protect it. There are so many times that that we as a society go out and try to accumulate an abundance of things, we put our life's value in those things, and then we spend the rest of our life trying to protect those things. Uh, one guy, he says this, every man who labors and amasses property is the object of envy. Get that, right? So when you have stuff, people, you become the object of envy. People want what you have, okay? He goes on to say, and is marked for the oppressor as a subject for spoil. Better, therefore, to act as I do, gain little and have little and enjoy my handful with quietness. Let me tell you, let me tell you a, a quick story. I, uh, I've, got, I've just got a, a plethora of guns. I love it. I love my guns. And, and, uh, but for a long time, I just I put them under my, under my bed. And, uh, and my wife, through a lot of... Uh, conviction and guilt, she would guilt me, she, she would say things like, what if somebody broke into the house and used them to kill someone? And I said, baby, if they broke into the house, they're going to kill more than one person because we got a lot of guns. And so she says, what, now what are you going to do with that? And I said, well, I don't know. And I was really convicted about this for, for a long time, like, what do I do? So about a year and a half, I don't know, a year and a half ago, we bought this, this uh, gun safe. And uh, I may have shared that with you, it's one of these, it's called, it's called the fat boy, I don't know why, but anyway. It's that big, it's getting hold, I don't know, 84 or some unrealistic number of guns. 
and uh, it's about, about this high. And now, I mean, the, the people say, did you bolt it down? And I said, they're not moving it. I said, if they can get it flipped over, they can have it, okay? And uh, the only way this thing's coming out is through the wall. So, uh, matter of fact, when we decided that when we move, we're just leaving the gun safe there, and then we'll let the next guy deal with it, right? So here it is. I've spent, I've spent my life acquiring firearms, and now I don't have any place to put them. So then I, then I put them in a safe, which now protects them from being stolen. I will honestly tell you this. That there, I, 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 don't, I have never lost sleep over it, but I have went to bed thinking about it. What happens if somebody breaks into our house and takes these firearms? See, the quality of life isn't based upon the abundance of things. As a matter of fact, I would say that the more things that we have, it actually reduces the quality of our life. Because now we are stuck in a, in, a, in, a, in a scenario where we are trying to defend the castle. So the more stuff we have doesn't increase the quality. I think it actually reduces the quality of life. Now probably more Christians are concerned about what they, that they have than they feel comfortable admitting. Now I'm not saying anybody here in, in, in this room has this problem. But what I am saying is that I think we all have the problem. Because I know I have that problem. I know that I struggle with that, making sure that I think things correctly. Because nobody wants to say that they are a prisoner to the stuff they thought would once set them free. We think that this will, this will, this will provide liberty. This will provide freedom. And really what it does is it provides captivity. Because now we are stuck in trying to protect all of the things that we thought would give us the quality of life are actually reducing down to nothing. The parable of the sower uh, illustrates this uh, very, very well. And uh, we're all familiar with the parable of the sower. A sower went forth to sow, meaning he went to sow seeds. So he'd have this bushel, and he'd take this seed, and he'd just scatter it around, and uh, he'd throw that kind of wherever it land, uh, that would hopefully then germinate. And he gives four types of soil which this lands on. One, he says it lands by the wayside. Two, he said, some fell on stony ground. He says some fell on good ground. But he said then that some fell among thorns. Some of the seed fell among thorns. And here's what he said. And also that received seed, he also that received seed among the thorns, is he that heareth the word, pay attention, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. So here it is. Here's a person who receives the word of God, and because they have really been deceived, there's the deceitfulness of riches, they have been de deceived by, by wealth, they've been deceived by an abundance, that maybe that abundance provides quality of life. They have been deceived by all of the cares of this world, that it actually, that the word is choked out, it says, and he become unfruitful. The desire for abundance actually kept this person from experiencing a better life. Now imagine that, that the way that we think of things is different than the way the world thinks of things. But we have to change our paradigm, we have to change our perspective on what we think quality of life means. Because when we equate quality to quantity, we'll fail. Quality of life does not mean quality of things or quantity of those things. It means something far greater. Well, quality doesn't mean abundance, but secondly, secondly, quality doesn't mean comfort. Quality of life does not mean that you're going to have a comfortable life. I think this is a, a, a common misconception. People think that uh, the better my life is, the more comfortable it will become. And I have some interesting things to say about this, but a better life may transform an uncomfortable life into a more comfortable, but they aren't one and the same. I, I, th I, think, of, I think of Paul and Silas in Acts 16. Remember? Paul and Silas, there they were, and uh, completely uncomfortable, by the way, they go out and they cast out this, uh, this demon out of this possessed woman. They get thrown in jail. They're fast, it says in, in chapter 16. They're fast in the stocks. Now, I don't know how many have been in stocks. I don't, think it means, uh, I don't think it means money markets and ETFs. 
I think what it means is they're fast in the stocks. They got these things around their neck, possibly. They're ball and chained. Uh, This is not a comfortable situation. If I was to ask you what you thought their peril was, what would it be? They're going to die, okay? They're not going to take Paul and Silas alongside and feed them good meals while they're fast in the stocks. They're getting ready to kill these two people for doing what they knew was right, and that was casting out demons and preaching the gospel. But in Acts 16, verse 25, it says, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So here it is, you have two very uh, godly people in a very uncomfortable situation with a very high, get this, quality of life. Quality of life does not mean that a person is going to be comfortable. As a matter of fact, I think of all of the apostles. I think of Matthew, who was a tax collector, probably had a little bit more comfortable life collecting tax from people. I think of other people who sacrificed their lives, laid them down on the line. They didn't have a a cozy, comfortable life, but they had a high quality of life. Forsaking all. What was required of the disciples? Not for salvation. Salvation is simply when you place your faith in Christ alone as your Savior. Discipleship is where you forsake all, pick up your cross, and he says, and follow me. That didn't sound comfortable. The better life, then, is somewhat subjective. One person says this, hence, Quality of life is highly subjective. Whereas one person may define quality of life according to wealth or satisfaction with life, another person may define it in terms of capabilities, such as having the ability to live a good life in terms of emotional and physical well-being. Listen to this, this is good. A disabled person may report a high quality of life, whereas a healthy person who recently lost a job may report a low quality of life. The Apostle Paul, who was in prison awaiting his execution, had a high quality of life. And he had, in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, the peace of God that passeth all understanding. That peace of God that passes all understanding kept his hearts and mind, didn't they? He had a high quality of life. A person with even the right perspective who used to have an abundance, who now has lack, can look at what they have and say, you know what, all the things that I used to have were empty and worthless. But Paul actually mentions that in Philippians 3.8. He says, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered, listen, the loss of all things. Here he had an abundance and he lost all things, and he says, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. See, we don't have to have a comfortable life. And we don't have to have an abundant life to have a better life. Something far greater than that. Solomon even mentions that in Ecclesiastes. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. This is a guy who could afford to do that, by the way. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, it all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Not only did the Apostle Paul look uh, reflectively on his life and said, hey, I lost all things, but it was done. Solomon could say, I had everything my heart desired, and when I looked on it, it was empty. Because the quality of life doesn't come from a comfortable life. See, we're going to experience some discomfort in our life, just like the Apostles. We're going to have struggles and we're going to have trials. We're going to have, it's going to, we're going to have problems. Let's face it. We were promised that. 
They that live godly will suffer persecution, the Bible says. It doesn't mean that there's going to be this, the, 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 the bed of roses, you know, we all dream of. Like when we get saved and we start to serve the Lord, everything is just going to be A-OK. I'm not going to have any problems. It's just going to be wonderful. And we smile. And we say, God is so good, and, 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 and I'm not going to have not even one problem. Let me read this to you. Tradition holds it that the apostles died in the following manner. These are men who not only trusted Christ, but then went on to serve Him, forsook all, and followed. Matthew suffered martyrdom by being slain with a sword. Mark expired at Alexandria after being cruelly dragged through the streets of that city. Luke was hanged upon an olive tree in the classic land of Greece. John was put in a cauldron of boiling oil but escaped death in a miraculous manner and was afterward banished to Patmos. Peter was crucified at Rome with his head downward. James the Greater was beheaded at Jerusalem. James the Lesser was thrown from a lofty pinnacle of the temple and then beaten to death with a fuller's club. Bartholomew was filleted alive. Andrew was was bound to a cross whence he preached to the persecutors until he died. Thomas was run through the body with a lance. Jude was shot to death with arrows. Matthias was first stoned and then beheaded. Uh, Bartimaeus of the Gentiles was stoned to death. Paul, after various tortures and persecutions, was at length beheaded at Rome by the emperor Nero. You think the better life is all about comfort? Better life is not about comfort. And I think that when we, all, when we get to heaven and we have to stand before this multitude, if we were to ask them, brother, do you think that you had a better life after trusting Christ and forsaking all and following Him? I would venture to guess that every single one of them would say, yes, I had a much better life. Even though they had loss of all things, they saw all the manner of what they had done and it was nothing. And they were persecuted to death. I think every single one of them would say, I had a better life. Because the better life doesn't mean a comfortable life. Martin Luther King Jr. says this, that the quality, not the longevity of one's life, is what is important. What are we going to base the quality of our life on? Are we going to base the quality of our life on the quantity of our things? Are we going to base the quality of our life on being comfortable? Well, if we do that, I guarantee that we're going to miss the mark. We are going to struggle all the time. We are, we are going to, it's going to be a, a battle in our life to find the peace of God because the better life doesn't come because of quantity abundance of things, or the comfort with those things. Whatever the life issue is that we are struggling with today, and I promise you this, can all be answered by God. He is the one, he is the one thing. He is the one person that we submit to, and when we submit to Him, literally things improve. This is why Paul and Silas can sing praises at midnight in a prison. This is why the vast majority of the martyrs uh, that died for the faith, they sang songs and hymns and spiritual songs. They sang this while being crucified because they knew that what they had to come, what they had to look forward to, and what they had now was a much better life had they, th than had they had not trusted Christ as their Savior. You see, it all begins when a person trusts Christ when someone places their faith in Christ alone, that's when the better life really actually begins, by the way. I know for me, when, for me, when, I, when I trusted Christ when I was 17 years old, I, I remember, now no one took me and discipled me. Uh, I, I, I find that that is one of the, looking back, if I could change one main thing, I would say I want to be plugged in, I want someone to take me along the road of discipleship with them. Because I got into a, a ton of bad things before I actually started to serve the Lord. 
But I tell you what, that's when my life changed. When I trusted Christ as my Savior, when I knew where I was going when I died, that was the primary thing that gave me a better life. It gave me hope. It gave me something that I didn't have prior. That all of the quality and quantity and comfort of things didn't mean one iota to me. When I trusted Christ, that's when my life changed. And that's when my life changed for the better. And friends, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I think everybody here knows Christ. I'm just looking across the crowd. I think everybody has trusted Christ as their Savior. But woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. That's what Paul said. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. And friends, if you're here today or if you know somebody who isn't certain of their eternal destiny, I beg of you to give them the gospel. If you don't know for sure, I want this hand right here to represent you and me in this wallet, all of our sin. The Bible says that God loves us but hates our sin. The Bible says to, to go to heaven, you have to have this sin paid for. And to make that payment, the Bible says that the wages of that sin is death. Someone has to die. So either you die with that sin, pain, and eternal payment separated from God forever, or you trust that Jesus Christ, and I want this hand, and I mean it reverently to represent the Lord Jesus, you trust that he died on the cross to make the payment for you. Now remember, the wages of sin is death, not church membership. Walking an aisle, giving money, raising a hand, praying a prayer. It's when you, in the quietness of your own mind, believe that Jesus Christ paid the sin debt for you. That's salvation. It's not about living a good life. If you could live a good life, why would Jesus have to come to pay for your sin? People say, well, if you, if you turn from your sin, if you turn from your sin, the problem is, is turning from your sin isn't the payment for sin. That's not the wages of sin. The wages of sin is not turning from it. The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die for it. That's why churches who say, well, you have to, you have to repent and turn over a new leaf and live a good life, and, and you have to forsake that. You can't even forsake it. And you know as well as I do, tomorrow you're going to go right back into it. Even before the day is out, you'll sin again. See, the sin that has to be paid for by someone dying for you. And if Jesus came to this earth and had sin, then he would have to pay his own sin debt and couldn't pay yours. That's why the Bible is very specific. He who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Salvation is really clear, isn't it? And when a person accepts that free gift, they begin to have a better life.